Okay, pick up where we left off, shall we? <coughs> Look about right. So we're talking about the energetics ones, right? So I wanted to just sort of get them all out there and then we wanted to sort of start slowly unpacking these guys. Um, and so let's start doing that. And so one of the things that um, we wanna do is start to kind of define some of these things. Right, so the idea of specific heat, basically what specific heat is, is essentially the amount of energy or heat needed to raise one, uh, one gram of substance, one degree C. It's actually a, a chemistry definition. Um, specific heat is actually related to something called heat capacity in um, chemistry, right? So it's a special case of heat capacity. And essentially that is what it says it is, right? It's basically that there's just the amount of energy that you can absorb essentially before you change temperature before you actually start increasing the degree C that you actually are. Now, the question is, what does this mean for water? What does it mean for water to have a high specific heat? Well, let me uh, kind of give you an example, an analogy, a little bit like of a thought experiment, just to sort of illustrate what exactly we mean by heat capacity. Because sometimes when you talk about things like heat capacity, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Even after you've had chemistry, sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But it has to go, it's part of that whole pantheon of chemistry where you talk about uh, clever things like heat transfer and stuff like that, transfer from one system to another, heat gain, you gained or lost, right? So it's kind of part of that whole thermodynamics section, oftentimes of chemistry that you kind of start talking about some new things. And that can get very sort of tricky sometimes for students because you got all this math going all over the place and, and, uh, and all these different ideas kind of all over the place. And, and somewhere in there is, is, is a specific a uh, part of this called calorimetry, which sounds really foreign and weird. And, and um, it has to do with this. Uh, I don't want to give it the chemistry treatment. I want to give it the biological treatment. So here's what I want to do. Let's do a thought experiment. Let's say it's summer, like deep in the summer, like the dog days, hot days of summer, where there's no relief, right? Um, and let's say we're in an actual state that gets hot, not like Colorado. Okay, let's say we're like somewhere like in Mojave, okay, or Death Valley. Right? They don't call it Death Valley for no reason, right? I mean, it gets up into 150 degrees sometimes there. Uh, you go there to die. That's why they call it Death Valley. Uh, so let's go ahead there. We're not going to die there, so don't worry. I'm not going to kill you guys off this time, right? That's a different class, a different lecture. <laughs> so, yeah, I reserve the right to kill you guys off in a future us in a future lecture, but not this one, um, at least not right now. So let's, what I want you to do is I want you to do something very basic. I want you to take a shovel. <laughs> You're thinking, great, we're digging a grave. That's, that's where we're going with this. Uh, no, we're not digging a grave. Um, I want you, I just want you to leave it out there. Just lay it down out there on the ground. No shade, no shelter. That's why we are in Death Valley. There's no shade and shelter there. Just lay it out there on the ground. Retreat into your air conditioned confines with your um, drink of choice and enjoy the day. Not too bad, right? So far, so good. Now, at the apex of the heat of the day, like around four o'clock or so, I want you to go out there and I want you to pick that shovel up. What do you grab? So you grab the, the handle, right? Which is, likely made of wood, could be made of other things, right? Plastic, things like that, right? Okay, great. Why did you grab the handle? Yeah, because if what happened, if you grab the metal, yeah, right? And if you've ever lived in a hot state like that, that's emergency room territory. You actually can incur a burn. It's bad enough to send you to emergency room. Um, that's a little known fact. That's actually true. That's not actually over speaking. You can actually 
burn yourself that badly with uh, something like that, especially with like metal. Um, the other, yeah, especially like if it's in Death Valley where it's 150 degrees out there. So here's the thing, right? We have two different materials, right? We have metal and we have wood. Question? Okay, I can hear you up here, which means you're probably distracting Memo back there. So, okay. So we have two different materials, right? And first of all, these two materials, are they in the same place? Right? They're not disconnected. Did they get the same amount of solar radiation? Yes. Um, so why is one hotter than the other? They all absorb the same amount of heat, right? They're all getting the same amount of sunlight. So why would one feel hotter than the other? The material, one's a better conductor, yes, because one of the materials is a better conductor, right? So they have different conductivities, which conducts both electricity and heat, right? But this kind of ties into the idea of heat capacity. So they have two different heat capacities which is their ability to absorb energy without changing temperature, right? So if you take a look then at wood, the handle, it has a much higher heat capacity, yes, because it's able to absorb the same amount of energy that the metal did, it's right next to each other, without changing temperature. The metal, on the other hand, absorbed the same amount of energy and it changed temperature like that, right? Probably my guess is within an hour, it was already up to temperature about as hot as it's going to get okay so it didn't take very long for that metal to change temperature very rapidly so it has a very low heat capacity a very low capacity to absorb energy without changing temperature so <clears throat> when we take a look at that then what does that do for us that's great okay so if we say water has a high heat capacity what they're saying is that it has the ability to absorb energy without changing temperature now, what does that do for us? Well, remember I said that I wanted to give you guys biological application so that you can kind of see what the benefit of this is. Okay. So I'm gonna draw something here, I'm gonna to attempt to. You tell me if it looks like something you recognize. A little dicey there on the southern end. Okay, there we have it. So, what is that city right there? Yeah, TLA Basin, right? How about up here? What? Yeah, San Francisco, Bay Area, right? So, what are the uh, temperatures like in LA? How hot? Define hot. in LA proper, like in the basin, like on the coast? <laughs> Maybe Denver hot, which is not hot, right? 80s, 90s, we're talking about average temperature, not like the hottest hot, hot. I mean, you can always spike, right? But we're talking about average temperatures. 80s-ish maybe, give or take. Right, kind of Denver-like, right? So there's a reason why a lot of people live there because that's actually pretty hospitable, yes? Okay, so now what happens as soon as we drive inland, not to, for maybe an hour or so, what are we running into? Yeah. So what does California have right, right in this area? Yeah, yeah that's where the, you gotta cross the San Bernardinos obviously, right? But then not too long after that, you're gonna be running into Palm Springs, which is a big landmark, right? Um, that gets pretty hot, it's in the hundreds. So it's at least a good 10 or more degrees hotter than the basin. Um, how about if you keep on going? Um, in this area, this, so this area right in there, that's where you're going to start getting all those nasty deserts, right? That's where Mojave and Death Valley are. 
So what? Vegas, yeah, kind of up there. It's it's a little not quite to scale, yeah. But Vegas is kind of like like right that way, whereas Arizona is kind of more that way. The deserts are actually shifted more like in this direction, although Vegas is actually in the deserts in the upper range of the desert strand. Um, so how far did you have, how long did you have to drive in order to get there? Have you ever driven that? Very long? Mm -mm, not too long at all, right? So it's not like you had to take a cross-continental flight to the Sahara to find the desert, right? It's there at your doorstep. Here's another one, being a Northern kid, not a Southern kid. Um, what are the temperatures like right around in there in the Bay Area, the average temperatures? Yeah. And it's 60s like all year round, like 65, maybe plus or minus five, right? It's like light windbreaker territory. like all year round. Literally, I didn't actually own a big coat until I moved to Denver because you don't find them in this area. You don't need, I mean, nobody buys them. I mean, you don't need them. Uh, they just don't exist, right? So really nice. There, by the way, there's a reason why everybody is like flocking to the Bay Area. Like there, well, there's a huge, massive population there. It's because those nice, beautiful temperate climates are Pretty rare to find. Okay. Now, what happens if you drive maybe an hour and a half inland? What are you going to find? What city is right there in the middle? Yeah, state capital, Sacramento. A lot of people don't realize this, but being in Sacramento for many, many years when I was growing up, um, Sacramento is, un, a lot of people don't realize how hot Sacramento gets. Uh, all the valley, actually, all the Central Valley, north, all the way down to south, the entire Central Valley gets pretty piping hot. So Sacramento, um, actually coming from Sacramento to Denver, um, I was actually kind of laughing at Denver a little bit in the summer because we were going through a historic heat wave in Denver. And I literally, I kid you not, it was honest. I wasn't like making fun of Denver. I was literally confused because of like the temperatures were like in the nineties, like 92, 93, that's what it was. This was the historic thing, right? And so we had some unprecedented string of days of 90 or, or over. And that was like some historic like meteorological record back in those days. And I was kind of like really confused. I'm like, so record cool? record hot because in Sacramento, it starts getting over a hundred in May and it'll stay there until September. So when you're looking at heat, you're probably talking about on average, I'd say the average temperature during the summer in Sacramento is probably right around a hundred. So it'll oscillate maybe five degrees north or south of that. So it's not uncommon to have like an entire like 30, maybe 40 day stretch of just everything over 100. Um, 106 was probably the most common temperature that I saw growing up in Sacramento. Uh, this was after my East Bay days. Um, so you can imagine going from East Bay, the Bay Area, nice and cool in the 60s to Sacramento, where literally I actually did this experiment, science nerd, right? Um, you can actually cook eggs on the street. That is a thing. I did it, actually, literally. Went out to the asphalt, cracked an egg on it, and literally it cooked all the way through. Um, it was like 106 degrees that day. Um, and you know, all sorts of health issues associated with heat, exhaustion, heat stroke, they're real. We don't really get that here in Denver, um, but in Sacramento, it's like you live with it. So you have like medics at the supermarket like that wait there because when it's 106 outside and you hit that grocery store air conditioning every single time. My brother used to be like a grocery store checker and he would actually say, it's like, yeah, we average maybe about five to 10 a day. Yeah, it's not a big deal. We just say like, oh, we got another one, right? Just, you know, and then you just give them the smelling salts, get them back into action, get them, you know, equilibrated to the cool. And then, and then it's a thing. It's just, it's not just part of it.
Okay. So, but notice what I said. You only drew how long? Drew long. That's a past tense, by the way, for drive now, drew. Um, you, you drove an hour, hour and a half, maybe. So this is how quickly the temperature changing from 60s to, oh my gosh, to all, and then of course you keep going up to the mountains. It's like, oh, although it's actually not quite as merciful up there either, because it can get up in the upper 80s in the mountains. Actually, you can get quite uncomfortable up there as well. So what's the difference? Why do we have this pattern? By the way, what's in between San Francisco and LA, this whole area right there? Yeah, the coastal mountains, right? Some of the most coveted real estate that people look forward to in California. This is where you're gonna find places like Santa Cruz, Monterey, Santa Barbara, it's a little further south. Um, but those cool coastal mountains, Carmel, right where Clint Eastwood used to live, Pebble Beach, that's in this area, right? So yeah, right? So all these famous places that people flock to on the coast, those are mostly in those nice, cool, coastal mountains they all have the same kind of an idea they're very cool very temperate but then you move not too far inland and all of a sudden it's smoking hot again so why what's causing those temperate oh, good uh, that a question because actually there's not a lot of moisture in the air it on the coast there is yeah. but in sacramento it's very dry actually it's very similar it's very similar to Denver. Sacramento is very similar to Denver. It's very dry, not as quite as dry as Denver, but pretty dry. And it gets a lot hotter than Denver. So it doesn't really have a ton of moisture, especially if you're not in the rainy season, right? Which is actually kind of a thing. If you go to Sacramento, it's like stuff dies in the summer. Like everything dies. It like turns brown, it's dead. You just kind of live with it because the rainy season is in the spring. And then once the rain stops, that's when the heat sets in and then everything just dies. So you get like one little shot of green and then everything just dies off. It's not like the Midwest, like in Kansas, like there's like summer rain, like, oh, and it's like everything's lush and green. It, that doesn't exist in Sacramento. If it's green, it's because we're actually piping water out of the Sacramento river to keep it green. It's not because it's raining at all. Um, as a matter of fact, when I first moved to Kansas from California, it was exciting for me in the summer because in the summer, literally in Sacramento, you can go like for almost a month or more without a cloud in the sky. And it's like 106. So it's like that, like, you know, cartoon level. It's like you got the sun up there, just the sun, nothing to hide you from it. Just clear open sky. And it could be like that for a month, just baking you and it's like and you wake up the next morning for the same thing and the same thing and the same thing and the same thing whereas like here in the midwest it's cool because it's like yeah it's going to get hot but guess what those clouds roll in and they kind of cover clouds don't exist in sacramento rain didn't exist in the summer in sacramento so like i remember when i first i was in nebraska once and and there was this like electrical storm coming through in the summer. It was like, I was so excited because I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like a cloud and it's like rain. And I literally stood out there on the balcony just watching. I was probably stupid, but I mean, just watching like the lightning go. I mean, it's like one of these really big, cool, you know, electrical thunderstorms. And it's just like, all of, I was probably stupid. I probably could have died, but I just, it was just so amazing because it's like, you don't see a cloud in the sky in Sacramento for so long. Um, it's just a completely different place. Now, if you've been to the Bay Area, you get fog from the coast rolling in. It's cool. Rain comes in a lot of times. Um, and it's not that pelting monsoon rain like we think of in the Midwest. It's that kind of, it's that sort of slow drizzle that just is low level, but just doesn't stop. It just keeps on coming and it's, it never goes away. And then you just end up being like jumping off of the Golden Gate Bridge, which many people do. By the way, don't do it. It's quite effective, by the way. If you're trying to end it all, it is quite effective. No question about that. The Pacific will just pull you right on out there. The sharks will love on you because um, there's a lot of them out there. So if that's the way you want to go, get eaten by sharks, 
cab at it. It's a little terrifying for me, but that's okay. Each their own, right? So what's, what's out here? What's causing this difference? You're only like an hour and a half away. So why is there such a shift in climate and temperature? Good. Bingo. Because what do you have out here? The Pacific Ocean. A big old heat sink with high heat capacity absorbing all that solar radiation and it doesn't change temperature. Why? Because water has a high heat capacity. What does that mean? That means those areas on the coast are having all of that energy soaked up by the water. And so it keeps those temperatures down. Now, as you get further away from your heat sink, you start to lose that coverage. You're no longer protected by the absorbing attributes of water and you're just sort of on your own now with that beat down of a sun. And that's the reason why the valley gets hot. So that's, so what does that do then? What it creates is habitats. that berry. If you don't like the moisture of the coast, just move, go inland. You don't like the heat of the valley, go to the coast, it's cooler. If you don't like the heavy rains in the spring of Northern California, slide down south where it doesn't rain as much. You don't like the Santa Ana's in Southern California, which is an annual thing that usually causes lots of those fires that burns down all these houses that you hear about. Then move further up north where it's a little moister, right? Moister, that's a thing, yeah, right? So it's a little more moist. So then, or if you want the mountains, go to the Sierra. If you want to get to really wet mountains, you go to the Cascades. Right. So basically in California, you've kind of got this interesting nexus of all these different things coming into play. One of the big things is the Pacific Ocean. And because of that, you have this like crazy mixture of all these different habitats. And what does that mean? That means that you can house a lot of different organisms. Some organisms are going to be adapted to those nice, cool coastal mountains. Some are going to be adapted for life on the water, but they wanna stay close to the coast. It's what's called pelagic. So they like to fly into open ocean, but they like to sort of stay close to the coast, right? Those are pelagic. You've got that all up and down the West Coast. If you want things maybe not quite so cool, but you kind of want maybe a little bit of a kind of river life, you've got that. Why? Because you've got a massive old Sacramento River coming basically right down the middle of the state. Um, and so there's a lot of organisms that can live there. It's a little cooler in the Delta, a little hotter away from the Delta. So if you want more open grassland, which some organisms do, if you're a grazer, guess what? You go to the valley, right? If you want some of the coverage of a mountain range, then you head up to the Sierra. If you like to live above tree line, then go way up in the Sierra. Or if you like to live in the foothills, then move a little, a little further down. So you have all these different habitats for all these different creatures to adapt to and to live in. It gives you more range to be able to find some place that you like. Okay. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons why there's so many people that live there. We're animals too. And we like to adapt to specific living conditions. There's a reason why the, why the majority of the human population lives on a body of water. Look at it. Make a list of the top 10 largest cities in the world. Almost without question, all of them are on a major body of water. Either a river, a major river, or an ocean, or a port city, or something of that nature. Right? That, why? Because of this effect because those coastal areas create the perfect climate that we like and that we can thrive in. Same thing is true for animals. So that's what the specific heat gives you. 
It gives you the ability to have lots of habitable zones that gives us chances to succeed, okay? So let's take a look at the next one, the next energetic one, the high heat of vaporization. So what exactly is the heat of vaporization? So this is basically the temperature at which a liquid turns to a gas. What is the heat of vaporization of water? Yeah, boiling point. Right. That's when you turn into a gas. So 100 degrees C, that's pretty high, right? That's pretty hot. Um, we measured it last time. It wasn't actually 100. I think you guys got up to the highest. I think you guys were 96, I believe, right? But still not 100, but still pretty hot, right? Um, now, what, why, why? Why do we care about this one? Um, this just kind of seems like a gee whiz sort of a thing where it's like, well, if you're just kind of like collecting random facts on water, this is one you hang on to, right? Just in case it comes in handy somewhere down the road. No, 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 no. This actually forms the background and the matrix for which um, we can uh, sort of overwrite living things. Think about it for a second. You are mostly made of water, okay? However, water is not the only thing in the world, is it? So let's do, let's do a little experiment, right? Let's say that we weren't made of water. Let's say that we're made of something else. I want, to, I want you to compare two different substances, two different liquids, by the way, okay? Here at room temperature, I want you to pour some water here on this little table, right? just like a little pool, not too big, just maybe, you know, just something small, right? And I want you to do the same thing with acetone right next to it. Okay, where do you find acetone? If I told you to go find me some acetone and bring it back, what'd you come back with? Nail polish remover, right? Now it's got a, a couple of other things in there as well, um, but you also can get pure acetone. They sell it that way as well. And so you're gonna put these two spots on the table and then it'll come to say, say you know, why don't you go and, uh, and just kind of go do something for a couple of hours, go take a lunch break or whatever, or we could do it at the beginning of lab and then we'll do our lab and then we'll come back to it in a couple of hours. So come back in a couple of hours and tell me, what do you observe? What does it look like to you? What are you looking at? Explain to me what you're looking at. So do you see two puddles? What do you see? One, what is it? Water, okay, what happened to the other one? So, how long did it take for it to do that? If you've ever tried to take something off with acetone, it's kind of frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, because it's like, darn it, I just wet that cloth, right? I mean, and it's like, there it again. And within a couple of minutes, it's like, okay, darn it. Right? It's like, you're, so it's pretty quick, isn't it? Right, so acetone is what we call volatile, right? Which is basically, any molecule that has a high heat of vaporization, which means a low heat of vaporization. What that means is that at a low temperature, you're gonna vaporize, okay? Now, a volatile, like acetone, is gonna have a very low heat of vaporization. What that means is at room temperature, right? Where room temperature is typically in like 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 22 degrees C or something like that, right? So it's, it's in the low 20s usually. Um, but it's, it's fairly cool, right? So what that's saying is that at room temperature, your acetone disappears. It evaporates into space, right? But not your water, right? What is it gonna to take to get that water to evaporate? So you have to get up to what temperature? 100 degrees, right? As a matter of fact, a lot of students will be like, yeah, but it is evaporating. Yeah, that's true. But what's driving most evaporation of water at room temperature is not temperature. It's not heat of vaporization. It's actually humidity, right? Because water is also a solution that goes from high to low. So if you have a very arid room, which we always do in Denver, right? Ask the lotion industry. We're like making their like life. I mean, we're padding their Mexican villas and their French Riviera mansions and everything. I mean. This is a place to make some sort of skincare because it's, yeah, we're terrible, um, right? But the idea is it's evaporating because of humidity differences, not so much because of heat. Okay. 
So here's the thing I want you to do. That's all well and good. We already had that one, didn't we? You already knew that before you walked into the classroom. So you haven't learned anything. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to take an experiment. I want you to say, instead of being made out of mostly water, I want you to switch yourself out. I want, to make you, I want you to make yourself out of acetone. If you were mostly made out of acetone, what would you look like right now? Not like this. You'd be like a little vapor cloud, right? Because isn't that what acetone is at room temperature? It's a vapor. And how easy is it us? How easy is it for us to exist as a vapor? We wouldn't have any sense of identity, would we? I mean, me as a cloud, I'd be mixing in with you guys because there would be like no boundary. It's like, oh wait, 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 no, those, these are your acetone molecules. These are mine. Good, we're just like all kind of like like become some sort of strange collective, right? Okay, why is that a problem? That's great. So we, nobody wants to be a vapor cloud. That's a bad thing, right? That's a bad day. So what, 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 so why? Why does this matter? What really is the problem with this, right? So think about this for a second as I fall in front of you. Um, so the reason why you want water to be not a vapor, but a liquid, Remember I said before, right? What are we looking for on, on, on other planets? We're not looking for just water, but liquid water. Now, why? Because all of biological life is driven by chemical reactions, right? And those reactants have to have access to each other, yes? Do they have access to each other if they're trapped and lost floating around the room in a gas? No, they're not, because here's what's gonna happen. Reactant A may be over here in the gas cloud. Reactant B may be over here in the gas cloud, but they're separated by space. So they're never going to see each other unless they happen to luckily randomly run into each other. Oh, hey, there we go. Now we can go ahead and interact and then go through a reaction. But then guess what? You've got your products now over here, but you need to get them over here. And this part is still floating on over here. So now you're waiting again. For now, okay, now that I got the reaction, now I'm waiting for these products to touch over here because that's where I need them. So you don't actually fundamentally have the capacity to do chemistry if you're in a gas. Why? Because all of our chemical reactions are what's referred to as aqueous reactions. If you take chemistry, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's different types of chemical reactions. Some are organic reactions. They take uh, they take place in an organic matrix, right? In ours, they take place in a water matrix, and that defines this entire set of water-based reactions, and we call that aqueous reaction. What that means is that we need water as a sort of a continuous substrate, almost like a background, if you will, on which all of these other polar water-dissolved molecules are able to sort of float around in. It's very similar to like you being in a swimming pool. So if you're in a swimming pool with a friend, you are connected together by the same water matrix because you're in the same water. And so you have access to each other. Okay. But if you don't have that water there, then there's no access. You can't actually do fundamental chemistry. Okay. And that's the biggest part of it. You can't actually do a fundamental chemistry in order to actually do any kind of a biological reaction. So really, not only would you be a vapor cloud, but you would functionally be a, a, a non-existent chemistry. Huh? Certainly not as functional as you need it to be, right, in order to get anything accomplished. Will you get lucky? Will you get a couple of reactions that happen here and there? Probably, right? Because gases are always moving around and they're just, oh, they'll bump into each other. But you're not gonna get it, you're not get it to happen in a consistent enough manner to where you can actually get forward progress and forward momentum, right? And that's the importance of the high heat of vaporization. Not only that, but what this also does is this also creates a wide range. Of temperatures to exist within. 
Think about it. 100 degrees C, pretty hot, yes? Um, zero degrees C, that's freezing, right? So we can go, you know, we can play around with freezing temperatures. So we can, we have basically a 100 degree range. So that gives us a broad temperature range within which we can be functional. You know what that means is we can go outside on a sunny day when it's warm and not evaporate. We still are in liquid water and we'll still be able to do our chemistry. So that gives us a wide range of temperatures to exist in. Okay. Otherwise, we're evaporating. That's the high heat of vaporization gives us. The other one that's energetic is the density of the solid. Now, this is something that's crazy talk right here. So in water, the solid phase of water is less dense than the liquid. This is crazy talk. This is the only substance that we know of that this is true for. The problem is we're so accustomed to it, we don't even think about it. If I were to give you guys a glass of water and put some ice in there and the ice floated, right? Which is what you'd expect, yes? And I were like, oh my gosh, the ice is floating. You probably think I'm insane, right? You're like, um, dude, are you okay? Right? I mean, we've seen this one before, right? From like when we're little, uh, not a big deal. Ice floats, that's kind of what it does, right? Yeah, ice does, but not the solid. Never the solid. Everything else on the planet, the solid form of it will sink in its liquid. Why? Let's take a look at it. We have three states of matter, yes? What are they? This is what happens. Let's start with the gas. Gas molecules are far apart, right? So you have these little guys just sort of whizzing around. Very, very light, that is to say low density, right? What does that mean? That means you have very few atoms per unit space. Why? Because they're so spread out. Um, as you start to cool off, What happens to the atoms? They get closer together, right? So now all of a sudden, you've got the same atoms closer together. They're more dense. So you've increased your density. Why? You have more atoms per unit space. That's your liquid. As you continue to cool it off, what happens? Yep. They get really, really tight in there, don't they? And all of a sudden you have a much, much greater density. Many more atoms per unit space. The more dense you are, the more you're gonna sink. So that's basically what happens with normal substances. Right, so as we kind of get in here, so what happens with water, water is the one thing that where it's kind of weird, right? So I'm gonna kind of walk right in here and use you guys as part of the object lesson here. But this is way what water does. So most things do this, right? So as you cool down, these sort of spread out gases, which would be kind of like you guys here, if we spread you out throughout the entire campus, you guys would be less dense, right? Because there'd be much more space in between each of us. As we come in here to the classroom, we become more dense. You can find all of us in a small unit of space, so we're more dense, right? But we're still not really crammed in here, are we? We're not really in here as close as we can get because you can make us more dense, can't we? Right? You can get in here and just kind of snuggle in here, go like shoulder to shoulder, like a fat elevator, right? Just kind of crank it in there. And then that's what most all do. They'll be like, okay, we're in here. How many of you guys have been on the light rail train coming home from Coors Field? after a Rockies game. Have you seen that one? Yeah, you gotta let it go, don't you? Yeah, there's a lot that you gotta let go uh, because there's just no way to get over that human crush of flesh, right? 
Um, I mean, you're just like, you know what? Uh, you smell terrible. Um, you smell like beer, like recycled a few times. And that's what most of the drink smells like, right? Because obviously you're game and she's a drink, right? It's just a thing. Um, and it's, you're kind of like, you know, you got some dude, right? And it's like, you're just sort of smashed in there and you're just hoping that some, you're, and you're thinking ahead of time, right? You're thinking, well, how in the world am I supposed to, how am I going to get to the door? Because when this thing opens, there's, I mean, how am I going to get through this, right? Without using the cattle prod, right? <laughs> um, it's tough, right? You got to throw elbows. You got to get New York with it, right? You're just kind of like, you know, excuse me, excuse me, pardon me. Piss a lot of people off, but get off the train before they realize that they're in. That's the, that's the, that's the New York subway uh, 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 process. Yeah, just, just move quick. That's the reason why New Yorkers move quickly. That way they can offend you. And before you even realize you've been offended, they're already gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so that's the thing. But anyway, right? So the idea here, is with water, it's a little bit different, right? So now most solids are happy on the Rockies train. They're dense, they're very dense, right? However, mo since, since, and that basically means they would sink in their liquid. So like iron, if you take metal iron, like solid iron, it will sink in molten iron before it melts into molten iron. So it'll sink up to the bottom. And that's true for everything. Now here's what's different with water. Water's a little bit different. Water, by the way, will do the same thing. So at 100 degrees and above, we're water, we're water, right? So we're not attached to each other with hydrogen bonds because we're separated. There's so much energy in us, the heat, that, we're, that we can't actually overcome that heat to form our attraction with each other. As we start to cool down, then all of a sudden, we're able to sort of start making some of our little hydrogen bonds with each other, right? And then as we continue to get cooler, we, get, we start contracting down at the condensation. So we start to make even more hydrogen bonds with each other, and we kind of start to sink down. So I'm going to stand right here in the middle of these ones, right? We kind of start to sink down closer together as we're liquid. As we start to get really cool at around four degrees, which is about refrigerator temperature, between zero and four degrees is roughly when water starts to freeze. Because what happens is under four degrees, this is where water becomes the most dense. It's like getting closer and closer together. But then something happens once it freezes that nothing else does. Once it gets to that freezing point where most solids would just be like, okay, this is just another one here, right? It doesn't do that. What it does is when it gets a little too close, it does what most of us do. Virtual face, it just basically pushes you guys away. And it's like, okay, this this is it. This is it. Okay. This is my this is my six foot range. Nobody come within the bubble, right? And what that does is now it creates this sort of lattice like work where I've got equal distance between these two water molecules and these two water molecules. And we form the same sort of thing. So there'd be one right there, equal distance from you guys. And we kind of form this sort of like, okay, this is our personal face. And so instead of getting tighter together, we push away from each other. And that's what causes expansion in ice. So if you've ever put a water bottle in their freezer, what happens to it? It expands. That's because you get to that, that critical level right before freezing. And once you get there, you basically say, nope, no, no, too close. Personal space. Right? And this is it. And that creates expansion. So what that does, and that means that the right there, right before that freezing point, right before they do that, that's the densest that water will become. That's like the right around between zero and four degrees. That's the densest that water will become. So that's dense water, that's heavy water. But then as soon as you freeze, you expand and you become less dense in water, which means this. And that's the reason why I floats heresy. That is chemi chemical heresy. A what? Well, I wonder how they did that. Yeah, I mean, I, but how did they do that? So they really jacked with it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like it's kind of like these guys here, right? So you only see these in like in the super collider that don't actually exist. So you can't get water to be heavier. It just it doesn't actually 
really in a practical way exist. It's possible. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can, there is such thing as heavy water because you have isotopes of hydrogen, things like that. So you can do some funky things with water, but in general, natural water, right? Water that we'll, we have access to, the ice floats. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you the biological application of this now. That's all cool. That's all nice. Yay. But so what? So here's a lake in the winter. So what's going to happen to that top layer of water? Yep, it's going to freeze, right? Now, if ice and water is like any other substance, what's going to happen to that layer of ice? It'll sink, right? Because it would be more dense if it's like anything else. Then what would happen to the next layer of water on top? It would freeze and sink, and it would go down and freeze and sink and go down. And pretty soon, what do we have? Frozen solid. Guess what? You can't do anything with that. Biologically, you can't do anything with that. However, since ice floats, you can do a lot with that, can't you? Every ice fisherman knows there's a thriving ecosystem underneath that ice shelf. Right? That's the whole impetus behind ice fishing. Right? The fish don't go away. They're still swimming around down there. They're still doing their little thing. You just cut a hole in the ice and you go after them. Right? So the fact that you have a protected layer underneath basically means you can have this thriving ecosystem year round underneath. Again, supporting biology and life. One of the reasons why we're looking for also, again, liquid water, because liquid water we know, even if it's cold, has the capacity to sustain living ecosystems. We know that because we've got them all over the planet, right? Especially up in the Northern area. So they're, they're all over the place, right? So lots of thriving ecosystems underneath in that cold water, but the water's not frozen. Now what we see less of is anything that's living sub substantially in frozen blocks of ice, right? So we don't see a lot of thriving ecosystems in the middle of a glacier. Bacteria maybe, yes. Algae maybe, yes. But anything substantial, no. All right, this is also the reason why we're looking for liquid water. okay so <clears throat> the next property of water kind of gets to our discussion of this aqueous piece and then the last one that i wanted to do i want to unpack a little bit is the organizational power of water So we have a nice little list here, don't we, of the properties of water. We basically created the backbone for a lot of nice biological benefit just from water. But this is all coming from a relatively simple molecule, H2O. And it's all driven by a relatively simple interaction, hydrogen bonds. So you can see hydrogen bonds are very simple, very simple to understand, but titanically important. Let's take a look at the idea of water as a good solvent. So basically what this means is that when you have a solution, and this is sort of a chemistry thing, a solution has two components to it. One is what's called the solute. This is what's dissolved. And the other one is the solvent. And this is what does the dissolving. So in this case, water is a solvent. That means that water dissolves stuff in it. So all those chemical reactions, like reagent A, reactant B, those are all solutes that are dissolved in water. And so water forms the backbone of these aqueous reactions. And so it dissolves mostly polar molecules and ions as well, but we can uh, do sort of tricks with other types of molecules as well. And this is one of the reasons why you have this as your fundamental sort of elixir of life, water, because it forms the foundation of all your chemical reactions. Now, does this mean that all those nonpolar molecules are off the table? No. 
you can make use of those nonpolar molecules as well, right? So um, there's actually some interesting thought experiments out there of like alternative situations, like what happened, what would happen if instead of water that life was built around methane? Is that possible? Well, technically speaking, it is because methane is a common solvent uh, that can dissolve lots of organic molecules. Um, but as it turns out, you'd be limited there because you wouldn't have any polar stuff, right? So, but that would bring in the entire nonpolar world. That would very look very different for us. But that's basically water as a solvent. That's the reason why you need to have liquid water is because it's a solvent. It dissolves everything that we need. All those chemical reactions are all dissolved in water and why you need water. That's why water is the most important commodity for all living organisms on the planet. Okay. Now, the other one is the organizational power of water. And that's this last one. So what do we mean by that? Well, first of all, let's sketch out some of the behavioral aspects of water. So basically you have two different molecules based on water. Water is kind of like one of those divisive types of molecules. It's like, you're either on team water or you're not. There is no in-between, right? It's you're in or you're out, but there's no in-between. So the first one is you're in. Those would be the hydrophilic. So hydro is water, philic means to love. Philic, phileo is actually a Greek rooted term for love. It's uh, the root of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love is what that is. Um, and that's a Greek term, uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia Eagles, for you Eagles fans, if there are any in Denver. I don't know if there are. I'm certainly not one. I'm certainly not a Chiefs fan, right? I mean, being a Raiders fan, it's very tough for me to pick one, but I'm, I'm going to have to go with the Eagles because I just can't bring myself to say anything good about the Chiefs because, well, being Broncos fans, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. So. It's we're, that's the one thing we can have in common. I don't want Mahomes to get hurt, but I do want them to be completely humiliated in front of a national audience. That would be lovely to see this chief spontaneously combust. Um, they've had their championship. They've had some good years. It's time for them to sit down and let some of the rest of us have a shot at it, especially in the AFC. <laughs> um, they're kind of like the red version of the Patriots. But anyway, um, so you're a water lover. What does that mean? That means you're polar and typically charged, right? Both of those will appeal to water because you have a positive charge on you. Obviously, if you're polar, that means you have a positive or negative charge on you. And if you're charged, that means you either have a positive or a negative charge on you. Very similar, right? And so those are the water lovers. However, what's the flip side of that? Well, it's the water haters, right? So hydro, water, phobic for phobia, this is fear. Um, these are the water fearers, okay? These guys tend to be nonpolar and uncharged. Now, let me explain this to you to make sure that we are clear on this. Water loving, I'm gonna go ahead with that one, right? Because you love water, your team water, it's like, yay, let's go. However, I like to sort of alter the hydrophobic one just the tad, because fear for me is not a strong enough emotion to describe what the hydrophobics feel for the hydrophilics. Actually hate is a stronger emotion than fear, because if you're in Star Wars, fear leads to hate, right? That's Yoda, just saying that's classic Yoda. <laughs> Right, I know. It's like, right, so hate is, and we're not talking about hate like, oh, I hate that person. It's like, no, you don't. I mean, they may annoy you, you may like dislike them, but no, I'm talking about the, the kind of hate that human beings aren't possible. They can't. They can't achieve. Even the darkest, most malevolent human being on the face of the planet cannot achieve the level of hate we're talking about. I mean, we're talking about like supernatural, like you know, super dark force kind of like beyond the human experience level of hate. Like, like you wake up 
every morning in the universe with only one obsession in your mind, and that is to envision and figure out how to create a universe where all of your hydrophilic hatred objects are it completely expunged from the universe. No. You're talking about a bloody, frothing, foaming at the mouth level of hatred that's so consuming that it completely destroys everything that you are. That's the level of hate we are. Now, most human beings don't get to that point because we don't, uh, something would happen to us. Like we'd either kill ourselves or somebody else would kill us or we'd die in the process of trying to kill somebody else. So something bad would happen to us that would take us off this planet before we get to this point, okay? But that's what we're talking about. So think about that. Every hydrophobic molecule is working actively toward trying to figure out how to annihilate every hydrophilic. That's pretty extreme, isn't it? Oh, by the way, the hydrophilics feel the same way. So you kind of have this almost like supernatural smackdown, right? Between good and evil, constantly going at each other, like that's so far beyond the pale that it's completely unimaginable. But that's what drives these guys. And the reason why I say that isn't necessarily to kind of, you know, it's, it's to drive home this idea of just how these two molecules feel for each other. Now, here's the cool thing about this. Because that's there, you don't have to do anything to these molecules for them to have these feelings. They're already there, yes? So that has some benefits to it. And water is like the smart one of the two, right? The, not, the hydrophobics are like the not so smart ones. Um, so that's how we portray villains, right? They're like really bad, but most of them are not smarter than the good guys. That's why the good guys always win, right? Because ultimately they kind of, outsmart the bad guys because the bad guys are just so consumed with hatred that it like blinds them to just common sense and then eventually their own hatred actually ends up undoing them because they can't actually outthink their the good guys right that's classic star wars that's how the sith always that's how the sith always lose right they just let themselves get out of control and then the jedi always win because they keep themselves under control and they know just wait just wait the sith the dark side they're gonna they're gonna spin out of control and they're gonna just shoot themselves in the foot, and they always do, right, every single time. Um, by the way, if you're wondering when I'm saying that, my favorite scene in Star Wars, which one was it? It was the second of the dark ones. Um, uh, not the Rise of Skywalker, the one before that. Oh, uh, the one where, huh? No, 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 that was, um, that was uh, Anakin's uh, final descent. Um, The Last Jedi? No. No, the last Jedi. Yeah, I'm talking about the new trilogy, the dark ones, the one that J.J. Um, Abrams did. That was the first one, and then it was Last Jedi, and then it was Rise of Skywalker, right? It was the Last Jedi one, right? The one where Kylo Ren is like doing battle, um, um, and and they're in, in the, his little overlord guys, and they're like, I can feel your anger rising. And then actually Kylo Ren makes the lightsaber cut the master in half instead of what he thinks is going to happen, which is cutting Ray in half. I love that one, right? Because that's exactly how it works, right? So the dark side is just so full of seething anger that it kind of cannibalizes itself when they have a perfect opportunity to finally overcome the Jedi. They end up imploding. That's what we're talking about here, okay? Go watch it. Great movies. Um, but anyway, that was free, by the way. If you don't know anything about Star Wars, you gotta go watch the movies. I mean, seriously, come on now. I mean, you know, I'm not, yeah, it's, those are the darker ones, but. So here's what happens, and we're talking about the organizational power of water. Um, this is what we mean. Because I know, let's say I'm water. Okay, and you guys are nonpolar molecules. So you're a part of the hydrophobic world and I'm, um, um, the hydrophilic one, I'm water. So I know how you feel about me. But because of that, I can automatically use that in order to gain biological advantage. 
So let's imagine that what I want to do, you guys right now are sort of organized in a particular structure, right? Uh, as nonpolar molecules. Now let's say, you know what? I, what I want to do is I want to split you guys in half into two different groups, okay? Not like split you in half, like in Star Wars, but like split you into two different groups. Well, how do I do that? I mean, is it going to be helpful for me to say, okay, you guys go over here, you guys go over here. Are you going to listen to me? No, what you're only thinking about is how can I stick a sharp object into his gut so I can end his mouth, right? Is that what you're thinking? Right, that's kind of what, that's what the hydrophobics are thinking. Okay, that's a little, don't do that, by the way. <laughs> I would like to live a little longer, so just saying, you know, try, try not to do that. But anyway, um, I try to refrain from that. I'll be like, I'll be like, was it racing my Yeah, it's a great one. They didn't kill me. It's like, that's a great one. No, <laughs> you know, it's a bad semester if that's how you're coming out of it, right? So that's, that was a rough one. But anyway, what do I have to do? All I have to do is this. So what are you guys doing as I'm walking by you? Where you hate my guts. You can't stand being around me. So what are you going to do? Yeah, you're, you guys are probably going to run that way, right? You guys are going to run that way. So what have I successfully done as I walk right in the middle of you guys? Did I have to do anything? No. The organizational power of water naturally used the relationship between hydrophilics and hydrophobics to force you guys into two different groups. And it took nothing, right? No energy whatsoever. It spontaneously happened. That's the upside of having such tension between these two groups. Remember, the key to biological function oftentimes as a resolution point is to create tension in the first place. From tension comes resolution. And that resolution gets us something. From the tension that we have naturally as hydrophilic hydrophobic, we get resolution which is the goal, separating into two different groups, okay? That's always the case, and biology uses that technique masterfully. If you want something to happen, create tension and let it all resolve, and something great will happen, okay? There's plenty of examples of that, and I'll point them out, actually, as we go through a music lesson to illustrate that exact point, but that's a future lesson, okay? Okay, now water can form ions. What? Yes, it actually can. Um, so we talked a little bit. So this is the backbone of the acid base story, right? So water can be written in its acidic form. So basically, when you take a look at water, it's H2O, yes? But water itself, and I'm going to write, uh, I'm going to do it up here. So water, if I write it in its acid form, can be rewritten as HOH. Where we, uh, we talked with the pH lab, we talked about uh, the acidic form has the, has the hydrogen in front and then whatever the other piece, the negative component is on the back. In this case, what's gonna happen is water will fall apart into the hydrogen ion plus the hydroxide ion. So that's what those two are. Um, and generally speaking, um, it will do this at a particular rate. And then, of course, there's a reverse reaction where it kind of comes back together as well. But this is what we mean by water can form ions. Now, what does this do for us? Well, what this does for us is it basically forms the backbone of how we define acids and bases. So, for instance, when water falls apart, it forms the hydrogen ion. So this basically putting brackets around the hydrogen ion means the concentration of the hydrogen. So there's a certain concentration of hydrogen ion. And it actually forms a certain concentration of hydroxide ions of so these two, right? Notice one is positive, one is negative. And it falls apart in a certain rate. So this is just basically an image. We kind of saw this a little bit already. Um, just by the way, this, this one is a little, um, should actually be moved up a bit. It got slide, slid down for some reason. Um, but this is just showing you the solvent effect, right? It kind of goes with this one. So it's actually an illustration of Four, okay, the solvent effect. Um, and so you can see that uh, when water encounters a salt crystal, which we already know, right, from previous slides that stack in this sort of positive, negative, positive, negative orientation, what happens is the water will actually rip out the ions. So it'll rip out the chloride ion, 
and will surround the chloride ion with its little positive tails. And it'll do the same thing with the hydrogen, with the uh, sodium ion. So surround the sodium ion with its little negative oxygens. Now, when it does that, it creates what's called a hydration cell. When it creates a hydration cell, it basically means it's been dissolved in water. Anything that has a hydration cell around it will be dissolved in water. Here's a good example. Let's take a look at a, not ionic, but a polar molecule like sugar, for instance. What's going to happen is water is going to start to form around this little positive area. So there's a little hydrogen tail sticking out there. And then the little tails are going to be forming around the negative end like that. Notice again, forming a hydration shell around the molecule, which means it's been dissolved. So anything that's either positive or polar will basically be surrounded by either the positive or the negative parts of water. And when it gets surrounded, it becomes dissolved. It's still there, but it's dissolved. That means it's become part of the solution. Is there a question? Did it get answered? Okay. So that's basically um, how the solvent effect of water works. That's how water dissolves stuff, by the way. Okay, so let's take a look at acids and bases and this sort of dissociation of water. That's basically what this falling apart process is called. It's called the dissociation of water. Now, the more hydrogen ion we have, the more acidic it is, right? Which basically means the more sour, remember that? Talked about that, and the more what? Not sweet, burn, right? Those are the two traits of an acid, right? Sour and burn. So the higher this is, the more sour and the more burn or the stronger an acid it is. If you have a high hydroxide ion, then basically that means the more base it is. Or whatever that is, right? So in this, in the case of water, it's OH. Uh, but like in the case of hydrochloric acid, that is chloride, right? So if you have more of that negative species in there, it becomes more basic. And so in water, generally speaking, what we create is our pH scale, right? And you guys played around with pHs. But the question is, what is it? And where does it come from? So we have a pH scale that we use to measure our acids and bases. It's zero to 14 scale, right, which you guys saw. And it's a logarithmic scale. Why? Well, because in a logarithmic scale, it's gonna give us a single number. Right, just the whole whole number ratio, and it makes it a little easier to deal with pH than to say, oh, well, this is ten to the minus seven moles, right, or molar. That's a little clumsy. So basically, when you take a look at, say, for instance, the concentration of an acid, then the pH is actually defined as the negative log of your hydrogen ion concentration. And I'll give you guys an example of how, to, how that works out, how you get the pH from that, just longhand. It's really not that difficult. It's just arithmetic and just a couple of log rules. That's about it. So I'll kind of show you how that works out here in just a second. But when you take a look at the pH scale from zero to about 6.9, you are an acid. This basically means that your hydrogen ion concentration is greater than your hydroxide ion concentration in this particular scenario. If you're seven spot on, you are neutral, which means your hydrogen ion concentration is equal to your hydroxide ion concentration. And if you're 7.1 or whatever to 14, you are basic. And that means your hydrogen ion concentration is less than your hydroxide ion concentration. So 
oftentimes what I'll get from students is the pH scale itself, right? So think about it for a second. We've got a scale that's zero to 14. What? Think about it. If I were to ask you, come up with a scale for pH, would anybody come up with 14? 10 maybe, right? Five perhaps? Maybe if you're really creative, 15. But would anybody come up with 14? I mean, think about it. Does that seem kind of like a random number? Why 14? Well, it's very simple why 14. Here's the reason why. Because when we look at the dissociation of water, the top reaction, we can actually measure the concentration of the hydrogen ion. We can measure the concentration of the hydroxide ion. What is that concentration? 10 to the minus seven molar in pure water. The hydroxide ion concentration is 10 to the minus seven molar. If you use your little bit of chemistry and you multiply these two concentrations together, the concentration of water can be expressed as 10 to the minus 14 molar, which is the reason why you have a scale that runs from zero to 14 with a midpoint at seven is because the entire pH scale is based on the dissociation of water. It's not random. Okay. It seems random at first, but it's not random. That's a common theme in biology. You know why? Because random is expensive. So you don't want to just randomly throw something together because it's costly, right? You, you want to have a plan. So having a plan is less expensive and more efficient. So let's then take a look at uh, defining our acids and bases. So basically when you take a look at an acid, it's anything that has the ability to increase your hydrogen ion or to lower your pH. Okay, so those are your two pieces of an acid. It will increase your hydrogen ion or it will lower your pH. A base on the other hand, is anything that will combine with hydrogen ion, which basically means it will decrease your hydrogen ion concentration or it will increase your pH. Why? Because every single time you add a hydroxide ion in there, it's going to mop up one of those hydrogen ions and basically take it out of, out of action, okay? And that's what causes it to be a base. And if you got more hydroxide ions in there, then it's, you're gonna have a net surplus of hydro, hydroxide ions and no, or little hydrogen ion, okay? So that's how you define it. There's other ways, by the way, if you get into chemistry, there's like three different definitions for acids and bases, depending on where you are. This is the most common one we use and the most useful one we use for biology. So let's take a look at this. We kind of saw this a little bit, didn't we? In lab, right? So the nice thing I like about this one is it basically will show you your hydrogen ion concentration on the left-hand column. And on the middle column is your pH. Right? Notice how they're inversely proportional to each other. So remember the negative exponent means it's a small number. It means it's one over 10 to the 14, which is 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times 14 times, right? So that's a really, really tiny number. So this is the lowest, this is low concentration of hydrogen ion down here. This is high concentration of hydrogen ion up here, okay? Now notice what happened. With the high concentration of ion, you've got the low pH, right? So basically, when you get down to here to like 10 to the zero, which is one, then your acidic, your pH value is zero, yeah. okay? Yeah. And it starts to move up from there. So the other thing I like to notice, and I could pull this out, is because not only is it kind of like a, a nice little sort of a view of things, but it kind of helps, gives you an idea. We saw a little bit of this already in the lab. This kind of reinforces it, but there's a couple of things I want to pull out of this one in addition. So first of all, as you start off with your lowest pH, you're going to notice you have things like hydrochloric acid, right, which is reagent grade hydrochloric acid. You don't have access to that one, uh, so don't worry about that one, right? The next one, the closest you get is stomach acid, right? We already talked about that one. Lemon juice is right around there at a pH of two, right? How many of you guys like lemons? I mean, not lemonade, that's cheating, right? But lemons. And if you bite into a lemon without aid, what, what does your face look like? Yeah, you get that, right? 
that's acid, that's at a pH of two. That's probably the lowest edible pH that we got. Uh, it gets down there, right? Nice. Yes, right? Because lemon juice, actually, we'll get to that when we get to the protein thing. You can actually denature protein with lemon juice. You can make cheese, actually, with lemon juice, um, which is kind of cool. Um, and, and by the way, you, you also, I mean, you can certainly like cook meat because you can do like fish, a uh, common thing, right? So basically, uh, I don't know if you've ever done like the lemon juice burned fish. You're kind of like denaturing the upper layers of fish with like lemon juice. Um, so that's, there's actually a thing. That's kind of a culinary strategy. I and mean, you usually cook it as well, like you steam the fish. So you kind of give it a little bit of a light finish, but mostly it's the lemon juice or the acid that's been, that's cooked it. Um, so that's the thing. Um, vinegar, that's acidic. That's coming around three. Some, most soft drinks are right around three. Just think about that. Next time you, you know, plow down three or four large drinks at McDonald's in a row. Cause if you're anything like me, you just kind of hook yourself up to the fountain. Right, I mean, it's just not good, <laughs> but you can't resist it. It's like, un, it's like not right. It's just wrong. McDonald's is wrong. Just that's absolutely wrong. It's it's wonderful and wrong at the same time because they know better. They know what they're doing. We can't resist it. It's like a dog back to its vomit. I mean, you just can't stop it, right? Beer. How many of you beer jockeys? Right, that's your favorite acid trip. Yeah, that's also acidic. So same thing could be said for pub crawling, right? Tomatoes, a lot of people have problems with tomatoes, right? Uh, because they say it's too acidic, it causes problems in their mouth. That's because tomatoes are coming around at around four. This is also one of the reasons why when you get into like culinary strategies, a lot of times uh, in some culinary dishes, like especially tomato-based ones, there's a lot of strategies to help neutralize the acidity of the tomatoes because you, what you want out of the dish is the flavor of the tomatoes not the acidity of the tomatoes. And so there's an entire culinary strategic background to how to deal with the acidity of foods. So you can get the flavors out of the foods without getting the acidity of the foods. Yes, yep. And there's a lot of other things you can add in there to kind of like, if you don't want it to taste too sweet or you don't eat, there's a whole spectrum of different things you can get in there. Do I? Mm, yep. Yeah, that'll do it. Um, you'd be like, what's this uh, baking soda taste in my spaghetti? It's like, oh, sorry, a little too much. There. <laughs> it's like, right, right, but I mean, you can you can do different sorts of things. Uh, my personal acid trip of choice, right, uh, which is uh, coffee, urine. Actually, a lot of students are surprised that this is one of your first, um, except for stomach acid notwithstanding, um, major body fluids that comes in. It's coming in around six, six and a half. That's average normal urine. Um, and the, there's a reason for that is because your urine is your waste. And oftentimes the way you regulate your internal pH is by dumping excess hydrogen ion into your urine stream to get rid of it. And so if that's not inside you, then you can keep that pH balanced inside you by dumping it in your urine. That's why it's acidic. Pure water, we already talked about that one. That comes in right around seven. Seawater is a little on the alkaline side because of some of the salts that are in there. Baking soda, that gets to... Um, the Great Salt Lake, they don't call it the alkali flask for no reason, right? Because there's a lot of um, alkaline salts in the Great Salt Lake area. Ammonia is coming in around 11-ish or so. Bleach is around 13. Um, oven cleaner is getting close to 14. Sodium hydroxide, which is like reagent grade base, that's NaOH, that's nasty stuff. Um, that's, you don't get that unless you are signed up with a chemical outfit. And usually they ask questions. If you're asking for sodium hydroxide, they're like, who are you? And what do you want with it? Right. So that's a very strong, very strong base, usually in dust, in dust, in industrial strength. But the reason why I say this is not to just take a little of a journey to sort of relive lab two. That's not the point. The point here is to point out one very specific thing. Notice what you see here. There's a pattern here. On this side of things, you'll notice a lot of things that you eat and drink. And over here, you notice a lot of things that you clean up with after you eat and drink. So here's the thing. I give you a glass of vinegar and I say, take a swallow and you do. Are you going to the emergency room? We're not calling, calling poison control. What if I take fresh squeezed lemon juice? 
nothing in it. Straight goods, not diluted, the real deal. Take a drink. Are you going to poison control? No. If I give you the same amount of ammonia and I say, take a drink, are you going to poison control? Yes. If I have you drink baking soda, like Homer Simpson, I love that episode. It's like Lisa's on first name basis with like poison control. It's like, you did it again. It's like, okay. <laughs> are you going to poison control? Yes. Yeah, it depends on how much you have. That's true. Um, but it's a little bit of a dance, isn't it? You take a swallow. How are you going to feel? <laughs> Pretty crappy, yeah? You're going to stick it out? Man it up! While you're vomiting? all over the place, hoping it all gets out. <laughs> so probably you're looking at, uh, we might wanna call poison control to see just in case, right? Cause actually by the time you realize you're in trouble, guess what? It's too late, right? So, or if you think about it, it might be a great poisoning strategy. It's like, you know, I'll give you just enough to where it's not obvious when you first drink it, but it's gonna like catch up to you. Like just at the right time when you don't put it together, that that's what just happened, right? This is the stuff of intrigue and states, right? Coup d'etats and things like that. If you're a Roman emperor, you gotta think about these things, right? Because somebody out there is cooking up a batch of baking soda for you, right? And they're probably mixing it in with poison mushrooms. Right. That's just something that they're doing. Um, so think about it though. We're calling poison control down here. We have actually quite a bit of tolerance down here, don't we? What that's telling you is that physiologically, animals in general have made a decision a long time ago that we're going to create a physiological framework that is tolerant of acids. But when you pick a horse and ride it, it's like, pick you right now who you're going to back because you don't get to switch teams in the middle. If you're gonna go with team acid, then your mortal enemies are going to be team base. If you're going to wire your physiology for having tolerance to the acids, then you're gonna have intolerance for bases. If we had chosen bases, it would have been the opposite. We would be calling poison control when we look at lemon juice, right? So think about that for a second though. Think about how that nicely that fits together. We just talked about lemon juice, yes? Soft drinks, a lot of soft drinks have a, an herbal root to them. They don't anymore, but they used to, right? Root beer, for instance, is a concoction of like juniper berries and different types of, it's, it's actually roots. There, there, there's actually plants and stuff like that that are just kind of all mixed together and, and uh, you know how to ferment and then it gets all good, right? <laughs> right. But it's a it's an it's an herbal background. Vinegars are natural. Those are natural fluids made by nature. Black coffee is an extract of a bean, right? Um, so these things are actually naturally occurring. I mean, lemon juice, and, and by the way, any kind of a citrus, right? These are all naturally occurring things. So think about it. These all came ahead of us. So we made a decision to basically match our environment. So like we just said, you know what? That lemon is good for eating. So we're going to create a physiological system so that we can eat it. That black bean over there, which actually is a black when it first starts off, Coffee, yeah, it's kind of a reddish color and you kind of have to, you know, roast it and then you have to do first crack and second crack and time it just right and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, all that, right? Oh, you, is that, well, that one right there, that's good for drinking. So we're going to create a physiological backdrop 
that will tolerate drinking that. That vinegar from those fermented fruits, perhaps, that's good for use, right? So I'm gonna create a physiological backdrop that tolerates that. Think about that for a second. That's amazing how that all fits together, right? How everything basically that, well, wait a minute. So we fit all these different edibles and we fit it together just like, just like we adapted to it just perfectly, right? I mean, we didn't look around and say like, oh, well, hey, there's like a lie over there. I'm gonna go eat on that one because it's not a food thing, right? So you kind of had these, this kind of weird fitting thing. That's what's so kind of cool about nature. When you look around it, it's like, it's not haphazard. It's like everything kind of fits together just nicely, right? Like interlaced fingers. That's kind of perfect. I mean, we could have chosen a completely different thing, but then we, I mean, all these other things in nature that came before us, by the way, right? We came after the fact. Then we, we wouldn't have had access to any of these. All these things would have been poisonous to us. Everything on the earth would have been poisonous to us as, as animals, right? Kingdom animalia, basically, right? So, I mean, it would have been a completely different existence. So, I mean, the fact that we took what was happening in a completely different kingdom, plantae, and managed to fit what was happening in us completely separately from what was happening in kingdom plantae, and yet we managed to sort of coordinate ourselves together so that we all interlace together perfectly so that the acidic things that the plants were making were good for food for us, is like an amount of, it's like an amazing conundrum of coordination that just like, when you look back at it, it's just like blows you away. And yet it all kind of came together and you're like, wait a minute, how did that actually happen? That's just like mind blowing, just how amazing that all came together. Yeah. Or like hot peppers are supposed to be hot because they're supposed to repel animal uh, mammals in particular, but then we love it. <laughs> it's like, right? But see, that, yeah, but so that's basically what that's so cool about it, right? Is you had one thing happening here at a very fundamental level, which was responding to what was happening over here. And then we were kind of all growing up together. And, and the fact that we got ourselves to sort of fit together was it's just like an amazing amount of coordination as it all sort of comes together. That's why it's so amazing when you look at nature like that. It's just like, it's just crazy the, the way it all kind of fits together. And like you're saying, it's like, you know, well, I'm eating your lemons and you don't like that. But, but, but I, you know, so, so you make this acidity, but then I like that. And so I add a little bit of sugar to it because I'm over here eating on the sugar. And then, I mean, you said all these different things that all have to come together and it's just a, cool the way that weaves together. This is what I'm talking about when biology is a tapestry, right? And they have all these different threads. Um, by the way, that's an idea. What you're talking about there is, a, is an idea called coevolution, right? Where one thing kind of responds to another and they kind of sort of evolve together so that they are sort of tightly attuned to each other, right? That's kind of what that's basically called is we refer to that as coevolution, that we kind of grew up together and we adapted to each other. Um, and that's kind of uh, that's kind of a thing. It's just amazing just how widespread that is. Because usually we think of coevolution as like isolated events, like a specific pollinator for a very specific flower, and nobody else pollinates that flower. And it's usually rare to see that tight linkage between those two things. But in reality, when you look at and you step back and you look at this, you realize, wait, wait, wait. Actually, coevolution might have actually been more like a rule than the than the exception, because you're really talking about two different kingdoms in two different worlds having to interact with each other and interweave with each other perfectly. I mean, it's just like amazing how it all comes together. Yeah, Evan. So that's, uh, that's one of the cool things. Now, buffer. Uh, this is one of the last things I wanna do here for this particular chapter, right? We talked a little bit about buffers. Um, uh, and by the way, I can talk forever on that, I mean, this the whole, because then it gets even deeper, it gets into speciation and how multiple species will actually 
and you can just keep going even further back. It's like, okay, so how do you do this on a molecular level? How do you start weaving these things together molecularly to build this physiology? Because our physiology is built molecularly. So how do you make those changes on a molecular level that then is expansive enough to create an entire, I mean, it's just, it gets better and better and better. It's just a fascinating, it could talk hours um, on that one. But it's an amazing thing. But let's take a look at buffers. I'll control myself. Uh, but let's take a look at buffers, right? Because buffers we already defined, right? We already defined it in the lab, so you guys are already kind of handle on that one. But remember, the thing about buffers is a buffers is essentially a solution that will just only do this: resist changes in pH. Now, the important thing is it does not maintain neutrality. That is not what it does the biggest mistake that most students make. It only resists pH. What does that mean? That means that I can actually have and create for you an acidic buffer that will maintain the pH at two. I can create and maintain a, a, a buffer that is basic that will maintain the pH at 13. And of course, then I can also make one that's neutral that will maintain the pH at neutrality. As it turns out, because most of our physiological pH and the pHs that we work at for molecules that are interesting to us, proteins and things of that nature, they exist around about 7.4 is our physiological pH. So most of our buffers are in the neutralish range. So it's easy to make that mistake, but that's not what a buffer does. A buffer can maintain pH anywhere on the pH scale. So the biggest mistake you can make is to say a buffer maintains neutrality. That will get the wrong, that will get points off immediately, okay? Because it doesn't do that. It maintains constant pH, regardless of where it is in the pH scale, okay? Always remember that. And so remember, we defined a buffer as a solution that has both acidic components to it and it has basic components to it. So when you add a base to it, the acidic components to the buffer will swallow up the base and, and neutralize it, and then it'll resist the pH change. If you add an acid to it, then the basic components of it will swallow up the acidic, the hydrogen ion, neutralize it, and then it won't change the pH. So it maintains your pH in whatever range it is that you manage to have that. So essentially, you're keeping your hydrogen ion fairly constant, okay, regardless of where you are. Now, what does this do for us biologically? Well, let's take a look at this. Let's imagine that we have a buffer. And usually we have a buffer like this. It's because we're studying some sort of an enzyme. That's active in a range of pH. Where's that range? Where the buffer is. So in this range of active enzymes, so that's what this buffer region would be. So this would be the range of enzyme activity. So whatever that enzyme does, if it stays in this buffering range, this, this pH range, it's gonna be active and you'll be able to do your job. The second you leave this range, you're no longer active as an enzyme. And so you're out. So let's take a look at this then. So here we have our pH versus the amount of acid, or in this case, base, that we're gonna add. So we don't have discrete volumes. We're just gonna add relative amounts. So first of all, we're gonna add a certain amount of base to the system. Now, some of those basic ions are gonna go in there. They're gonna get mopped up by the acidic elements of the buffer. And if you notice, you get very little pH change. Let's double the amount of base. Twice as much base is gonna get you a little higher in the range, but still you're sub five. You're not even up to five yet, okay? Because you've gobbled up and mopped up all those basic ions in there. Let's add triple the amount of base. This is getting insane now. You notice you're just now at five, maybe a little north, but you're still well within your buffering range. Guess what? You've got active enzyme still, right? Let's add quadruple the amount of base. Now it's getting really insane. You're still in your buffering capacity. You're just above five, you're about five and a half-ish or so but you're still easily within your buffering range. Now let's finally add five times as much base. Finally, now, 
you've broken out of your buffering range. You've exhausted your buffer. It no longer has any ability to resist pH change. And notice what happens when you break the buffer, it increases very quickly, exponentially. So what would this look like then without the buffer? The pH change would look something like this. So what does that mean? So in a pH, so if you had to be four to six, so here's four, here's six, then that means if you had no buffer, this would be your range of active enzyme. That's it. With your buffer, uh, oops, right there. This is your range of active enzyme. How long your enzyme can remain activity, maintain its activity. So that means that you can make a mistake up to four times the original concentration and still have that enzyme be active. This is one of the reasons why in biology, we're not analytical we don't quite have the same stringency as you do in chemistry, right? You make one little mistake in chemistry, one drop here or there, it just screws your results up. In biology, you get within two-fold, you're good. Two-fold here or there, you're still in range, right? Why? Because all of our systems are buffered systems. Now, what does this do? What this basically means is that with a good buffer, that you're able to resist dramatic additions or fluctuations in the influx of base or acid and still maintain enzymatic activity. So that means that I can, like if I'm just a single celled organism and all of a sudden I got this big influx of acidic water coming in and that's what I'm floating around is water, then with a nice broad range like this, with good buffering capacity, I can resist that influx, that insult of acid coming in at me I can resist that and still maintain active enzymes. I can still live. So it gives you a lot more toughness and ability to survive. That makes sense? Uh, I gotta love biology. Okay. So this is our biological buffer. So our physiological pH is right around 7.4. We maintain it. Right around 7.4. You took the your blood buffer, right? So the your blood is about 7.4. Most of your body fluids around 7.4. Okay. And we maintain it there. That's why we offload acid in our urine, is to maintain that 7.4. So what causes that to main be maintained? What's our buffer that maintains that 7.4? It's actually the carbonate buffer system. We're going to play around with this one actually uh, shortly in, in lab at some point in the photosynthesis lab in particular. But this is your carbonate buffer system. So carbon dioxide, which is everywhere in the atmosphere, yes? When it gets mixed with water, will actually convert, notice the reversibility of the reaction back and forth with water and will become an acid, carbonic acid. Notice the way it's, the way it's written, right? With the hydrogen on the, on the front. Carbonic acid will then dissociate into bicarbonate, as in sodium bicarbonate, hello baking soda fans, right? So of bicarbonate fame, and of course, your hydrogen ion, which basically creates and drives down your pH. What happens, however, if you're getting a little too acidic? What happens if you have to offload this and readjust it? Well, what happens is you can actually push this in the reverse re direction. So you can take your hydrogen, smash it back onto bicarbonate to become carbonic acid. You can force this one in the reverse direction to cause that CO2 to pop off. And then this one, you can basically breathe out because a major gas that you breathe out is carbon dioxide. So there's two ways you can actually regulate your buffer system. Breathe out the excess carbon dioxide that will bring your, your pH levels up to keep them in that range or to offload that extra hydrogen ion into your urine. Both of those will help you regulate your pH. So that's our buffer system. There's actually other buffer systems, but that's our, our major one. So that's actually a good place to start. 
we'll start off with chapter three next time.